Forbes has a study for the most uh, turned out companies from a crisis into prosperity. And they figure out that the finance and the CEO all together, hand on hand, they played the most biggest role to shape up the strategy and turn the company around. And I do believe that finance, they are the on the driving seat, not only as a co-pilot when it comes a company in a crisis and how to drive the action plan to be on the prosperity as a company. So giving this content, I'm really happy to have you off in this discussion. So welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you, Ray. Looking okay. forward to it. So we introduce our guest in, uh, in our show by asking about the purpose. If I may ask you, Ralph, what is your purpose in life? My purpose in life, um, I, I need to really uh, frame it the right way. But reality is I'm a, I'm a father of twins. I have twin girls. They've just turned 17 years old. My wife, Dian, uh, she, she uh, has been with me um, for the last 25 plus years. So we have a very close knit family. Uh, we've traveled a lot. Uh, we, uh, I grew up in Australia. I was born in Australia, actually, and uh, started my career there, went to school there, and I started to travel. I took my first position when I moved into Asia. Indonesia was, was my starting point. I became a CFO at a very young age. Maybe I'll touch on that a little bit later on. And uh, I met my wife in, in, in Indonesia. We got married um, at some point, and then uh, we moved to Paris. And in Paris, uh, we were lucky enough to be blessed with, uh, with twin girls. Twin girls. Um, and yeah, and then finally I made my way here to Dubai. And uh, yeah, look, uh, to be honest, family for me is, is, is very important. Uh, it's, it's something that I, I uh, strive every day to be a, a very, uh, you know, the best I can as a, as a father, as a husband. Uh, but I take care of myself as well. You know, I, I work out every morning. I have a home gym, which I built during COVID. Mm. Uh, and that was something which, which helps me focus and, and, and really uh, gets me up very early i've noticed you do the same as well but uh, yeah getting up early uh, 5 30 in the morning going for a workout doing a walk a nice walk clearing your head thinking about the day ahead the objectives of the day and taking it from there and at its at its basic uh, basicness if, if that's the the right word that's that's what i do that's that's my purpose and my purpose is to always better myself and think about you know, what can I do to connect with people? And this is maybe how we got connected. You know, I mean, I, I look, you know, and I, I saw you at the uh, World, World Finance Forum and I said, look, he's an interesting guy. He spoke very, very authentically. Mm. Uh, and that's why I said, you know, maybe we should, uh, we should connect someday. And uh, you suggested the podcast and I said, why not? You know, I think it's a great, great chance for us uh, to connect in an informal way. Um, and this is what I'm looking forward to doing today or this evening. Okay, so uh, having a purpose uh, or writing the purpose or believing in the purpose is half of the way. But keeping this purpose flowering every day, this is the hard drop to keep it flowering every day. If I summarize what you said, so your purpose around having the basic stuff right, uh, family first, um, and connecting with people, as simple as that. Absolutely. These three elements during a full-time job is not easy to sustain and maintain every single day. How you get the energy, how you keep your purpose flowering every day to connect between, to, to make sure that you sustain these three mini purpose, if I may say, uh, on the go in your journey. It's a balancing act. Definitely it's a balancing act because obviously I do have a, a full-time job, but at the same time, you got to make time to be present when you need to be. If there is a school concert, um, then I make the effort to be at the concert. If there's an event on the weekend uh, that involves the family, I'll, I'll again uh, make sure that I can be present for that. Um, I remember a year or two ago, my daughter competed in the world championship. She's a jujitsu uh, mm. practitioner. So I made the effort to be there and I may, I've pretty much been at every tournament she's, she's competed at. Mm. Uh, and that's just something, having your father there um, you know, as you, as you go through the process of competing and the pressure that you're under and having someone that you love cheering for you, being by your side, 
um, cheering you on and, and consoling you if you don't win, but at the same time cheering with you at that, at that glory stage as well. So I think this is something which, and as an experience is important. You talk about, uh, you know, flowering. That's how you flower your entire unit, your home unit, hmm. you know, by being there, being part of the experience and not being absent, hmm. you know. And I think that, that management is, is, is really important. The other thing I want to touch on is there's many things that you admire in, you know, that you might see someone that you admire. You might think of certain ideals that you admire. You need to stay connected with those ideals. Hmm. Um, I think back through my early career, I had, I had certain... Um, mentors and these were people that you know uh, you looked up to but you also wanted to learn from you wanted to to you know uh, grasp ideas from them you wanted you wanted you know as much information as you could possibly get from them mm. because you realized that if you could only be half as good mm. as them that you would be you know uh, great and it's Again, it's, it's, it's about ideals as well, right? I mean, what are your ideals and what, what, what sort of, um, you know, principles do you, do you operate under? You know, this is really important, the value system that you carry. Okay. Yeah, and I think all of these are important when, in, when you talk about flowering and that makes the complete person, mm. yeah? So just a question, have you ever missed one of your uh, lovely daughter's events Tournament before, because you have months in the closing, forecast, executive meeting, business travel yeah. at any point of time. It just happened very recently. Uh, it was a school concert. Yeah, and how did you manage it? Um, I luckily today uh, it was beamed. I was actually in Paris, uh, you know, and uh, I had to be in Paris at that time, so I actually beamed it live. Uh, and again, I, I I watched it. I felt a little bit emotional by not being there. Probably haven't told her that, but reality is uh, I did feel that way. Mm -hmm. um, but you know what I did? I posted about it. I posted about it on, 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 my, uh, on my Facebook page. And I said, you know what? You know, I missed this, but hey, um, I'm still very proud. Mm. I'm still very proud. Okay. Um, yeah, I think that, that was the way I, I, I dealt with it. And, uh, you know, I think there will be another, another time and we'll be able to make up for that, hopefully. Yeah. Okay. Um, I appreciate your authenticity sharing that because no, absolutely. as a working dad, yeah. you cannot balance it all the yeah. time, every day. It sometimes flip around, yeah. but you got the chance to fix it or at least look at the future, how you can, how you can sustain it. Exactly. You don't make it a habit because, mm. you know, sometimes, you know, if it's a habit, then they realize that, oh, maybe perhaps, you know, you don't really care or you don't follow, you, you don't want to, you know, interested in, in, in what I'm doing or how, or, or my, uh, my hobbies, it's, it's, not, it's not true. We try and balance and sometimes it just doesn't get right. You know, it doesn't sort of land right. Yeah. Okay, so moving to our main subject, which is related to the, uh, the finance leader journey as an overall. Uh, to be honest, I was fascinated by the one of your speech in one of the conference related to the uh, CFO office or CFO attributes uh, yesterday and today and tomorrow. Uh, now, let's kick off this discussion and see what are your views. If you're going to share the CFU attributes yesterday, and yesterday means literally yesterday because everything is evolving every day, as you can see, and today and tomorrow, what will be the main attributes or similarities or differences between these attributes of the CFO office between these three time period? Yeah, I think um, I'm going to go back. Because mm. I actually started as a trainee, a trainee accountant. I think that's a little bit, my, you know, my career. I started as a trainee accountant, and it was funny because, and it was, I was in Australia at the time, and it, it, reality is they used to call accountants bean counters, you mm. know, yeah. And, you know, I, I kind of took offense to that, you know, and I said, bean counters? I mean, surely we do more than just count beans. But that was, again, a term to really... Um, minimize the value of, of, uh, of finance and what, and what we did. But in reality, what a rea reality is, if you go back a little bit, you realize that the role of finance was transactional. You were, you were undertaking a lot of transactions. You were um, bookkeeping, uh, bean counting, if, you, if uh, I want to reintroduce the word. 
Um, and it was, you know, the closing. And uh, there were very, very, uh, sta you know, statutory sort of uh, objectives and, and, and tasks. Um, but not so much forward thinking, not so much challenging the status quo, not so much managing through, through, through leadership. And that's a little bit been the evolution that we've seen uh, over the years. So if you think about what I've just described as finance, if you move forward, then you see, okay, finance is a little bit more than that. It has a seat at the table. It can contribute to strategic thinking. It can come up with interesting ideas. It can uh, have a different perspective, can be the um, devil's advocate. I always use this term, you know, the what if, what if this happens, you know, um, and having that rigor in the decision making, having being the person who, when you do decide to go into a certain market or introduce a new product, that you actually have someone who assesses the rigor around that. When are we going to get that return on investment? Mm. When are we going to get the payback on that investment? Mm. You know, is there a payback on that investment? You know, <laughs> these are the questions that often, through the excitement of the frontier, whatever it might be, right, are sometimes put aside. But having someone at the table who can address these points is what I say, what I see as the role of finance today. Moving forward, um, it goes into so many different directions. Mm. Technology is going to play a huge part in what finance does moving forward, especially AI. Mm. Okay, and AI, how we deal with AI, how we move up the value chain as a result of AI uh, taking, taking on a lot of the transactional activities of finance is going to be a key, key play. Um, and how we maneuver through crisis. You spoke about crisis. I've been, if I think about it, over the last 20 plus years, so many different crises. <laughs> to be honest, I remember the dot-com crisis that, mm. that, 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 that happened, you know, because I was in the telco sector at the time. I lived in Southeast Asia when, when uh, the bird flu and SARS were, were, were prevalent and, and basically it shut down uh, Southeast Asia. Uh, I was here when, uh, in, in Dubai when the, um, uh, the global financial crisis uh, happened. 2008. Yeah, in 2008. Um, and of course, we were here during COVID and we saw the impact of COVID on, on, uh, on business. And I think throughout those crises, the role of finance was so important. And going back to, to uh, the motto of today's this, you know, conversation, is how do we go from, you know, uh, managing through crisis to prosperity and the role of finance? And the role of finance during those crises are pretty much, in my mind, has been, have been the same. Mm. And the focus ultimately is on three things. The first thing, and I think you'd be surprised, that it would be no surprise to you, in fact, is managing your cash flow. Because if you manage your cash flow, right, you, you kind of ensure you have some breathing space. Man, you, know, you know that you're going to have continuity of business for three, six, nine months by really, really managing that cash flow and obviously look, your liquidity as a result of that. The second one, second aspect, is cost, managing your costs. You know, as much as possible, working out what are your essential costs that you have to spend to keep the business viable, and perhaps which thing, which which costs can be deferred for some time, put on pause, and reintroduced at at the right moment. The third aspect is providing the right early warning signals, mm. uh, early warning signals to boards, to management about things changing? What are the signals that are perhaps showing us that we're out of the woods? Are we out of the woods? How do you know? You've got to look, you've got to read, you've got to read the signals. There are some metrics that you can follow, early warning signal metrics that can help you judge this, uh, judge this topic. So for me, it's really, 
If you can, as a finance leader during a crisis, address these three points, actually, you've done a pretty good job. Mm. Um, and you've done your bit and more, perhaps, um, you know, in, in helping get the organization ready for the, for, you know, the positive, for the growth phase. Because mm. once you're in the growth phase, then it's really about accelerating and it's about doing better than whoever your competitors are. And I think if you use these, this philosophy, it works for any business. Seriously, you could be selling fruit and vegetable, mm. right? It's the same, you know, you adopt the same principles. You know? Okay. I think these, these three points, they, they need an episode standalone. Uh, but you set the tone correctly for the discussion now. So as a summary of that, given all the challenges, the common similarity for the business to survive, one is to, con to monitor your cash flow Make sure you have the room to breathe, as you yeah. said, because cash is like the blood in the business. Yeah. And if it stops, the business will immediately stop. Correct. Business can tolerate impact on margin, profitability, but they will never tolerate a fixed cost or salaries that need to be paid as we speak now as a cash flow. And then, of course, monitoring your costs, optimize your cost. Optimizing costs is like giving all the time, but at the crisis mode, you have to act differently in costs. We're going to have a point on that. But I really love, love the, the last element, which is the early warning signals and how you equip the, the system, the business, was like tsunami, so the business can be ready to absorb the hit, um, wherever the hit is coming from, and see the alternative around. And they don't work up as a surprise every day. So they have the early warning signals yeah. to, to react. And these to are good and bad. Hmm. Either way, I think it's still early warning signals. You could have good, good information, hmm. positive news, Mm. And negative news. Mm. So either way, generally boards do not like surprises. Of course. <laughs> it doesn't matter what they are. We've seen it, right? I mean, if you miss something, it can have a huge impact on, on the share price, mm. right? on the valuation of, of uh, whatever company you're talking about. Mm. But this is why it's so important that finance is at the front, leading, leading from the front, and b provide those metrics that can determine, do we need to pivot now? Mm. Do we need to pause? Do we need to stop those levers? In crisis, you can't control everything. You need to focus on what you can control. And ultimately, those three things that I've mentioned are what you can control. You can't control when the market's going to come back. You can't control when COVID was ultimately going to, uh, going to subside. Doesn't, it didn't stop at the end of 2020 or at the end of 2021. Mm. It didn't respect boundaries. It didn't respect countries, country boundaries. It didn't respect years. Mm. It just faded away. Okay. Uh, if, if I just go back on these three points, as you can see, in crisis, sometimes the business not at the same tone as, a, as a, the full board of the meeting. So let's, let's go back to the seating uh, point that finance has a seat on the table, the business on crisis, and the finance try to guide the business through these three elements. These are the three warning signals that we have in the crisis, our cost, we need to work in X, Y, Z, and then the cash flow. Because of the purpose of the cash flow, we need to, to prioritize these set of actions. In that board meeting, you have different colleagues and board members. You have the sales director, you have the human capital director, the CHRO, you have the IT. And sometimes, sometimes, I'm not going to say all the time, we're not in the same tone when it comes to the investment. Everyone has a committed. And they don't feel the heat of the crisis. How you as a leader during this crisis, you as a CFO, as a finance leader, you bring everyone on the same page when it comes to the right priority during the crisis to behave and act in the market? It's not an easy one. That's, that's certainly a tough juggling act because at the end of the day, there are things that you're talking about things that are going to impact the longevity of, of, of the company. Let me go back to the days when I was in the telecom sector. Hmm. I still remember during uh, the, 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 the time when the Chinese manufacturers were coming in and really undercutting a lot of the European, uh, the European manufacturers of, of telecom products. 
the crisis was certainly there in that industry. It was really, really impacting. There was a, a commoditization of, of, of the products. So I remember the CEO when they came in and he said to me, you know what, Ralph? He said to me, the army is in charge. And I said, what do you mean? He said, yes, yes, the army. And I said, I'm, I'm not sure what you're talking about. He said, yeah, finance. And and he attributed the, the the work of finance during a crisis as the work of an army. Now, what happens in 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 when when the army is in charge? And I think we've seen it in some countries. Mm. Right? It's like martial law. Mm. Right? Now, obviously, that is an extreme, and certain extremes don't have to don't have to always play that play out that way. But getting the buy-in of of everyone is really important. It is really important. They really need to come to the table. And again, it's about maturity and, and having the right people discuss the, the real matters with maturity, knowing that the crisis is there, the crisis is impacting everybody. And if we don't get it right, what are the implications of not getting it right? You know, um, again, it's not to say that we don't do anything that's strategic, right? Or make certain investments if we have to make an investment we make an investment i i think i used this example once right in in in, in the uh, in in the conference and i said how many times have you heard someone come to you and say to you you know what Rita, we need to do this and then you look at him the person you say okay but why and he said oh because it's strategic Do you know what the word strategic means? What's the what's the it's the code word for something else? It's coming from the top. No, no. <laughs> Actually, normally when someone says it's strategic, mm. it means that we're going to lose money. <laughs> True. You know, it's an investment. It's an investment. So all the basic rigor that you put around that is put aside. But the good news is. You just budget for it. Mm. You put it into your plan. Mm. And then you say, this is what it costs. Mm. You know? And then you move on. You know? So even in a crisis, you can make an investment. You can make an investment. Even in a crisis, you can choose to make an investment. Right? As long as you know the impact on your balance sheet, on your P&L, then it's okay. The problem is that when you don't know or you don't want to know, that's the, the, the hard part sometimes. You know? And then you get surprised. Then you get surprised. But this is where finance, again, has to play a role because as a finance leader, you also need to understand how transactions impact your balance sheet and your P&L. So as you decide to invest in a market, or roll out a new product, you should be thinking, how does that impact my balance sheet? Do I have enough cash to invest? Do I need to borrow money? Do I need to leverage something else? You know, and run those models. That's the rigor that is so important in order to make sure that the company is being steered in the right way. How do you decide that the company came out of the wood or out of the crisis? What kind of matrix you say that we pass the crisis phase? Generally, yes. it's it's through your clients. You know, through your clients. Hmm. Yeah. If your clients start to activate requests, requirements, it's your, it's a volume. Uh, it's a demand game. Hmm. So, and again, no matter what business you're in, if your demand starts to pick up, and the signs of it picking up, right? starts to start to appear that is a clear signal that the business is turning around the market is turning around that's for me um, you know in economics if I go back to economics 101 that animal spirits that mm. they talk about right mm. it's the same thing mm. right you start to see the animal spirits pick up more inquiries more um, you know, uh, more follow-ups, more requests. 
Okay. Yeah. Well, I like the idea that you <clears throat> you picked up the the point when it comes to the demand and the volume. Mm. Where the typical traditional old finance attributes will be related to profitability, for example, or having enough cash, correct, or the right level of cash, to be exact, and that's one of the shift of the attributes of the nowadays finance lead that play the role picking up the demand, speaking about the clients, speaking about the volume, not leaving the volume for the sales to speak about. It's one, one the, the 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 generator of the PNL at the end. So you need to make sure that you have the right set of volume to have the right set of the financial Absolutely. performance. So since you've seen the crisis, different geography, different companies, different countries, different people with different background, my question was about what is the common similarities when it comes to the crisis? But I'll change the question. Do you see any common behavioral, organizational behavior changes from region to region, industry to industry, responding back to the crisis? Yes, yes. I think, I think, obviously, I've worked in amongst different cultures. Mm. Yeah. So this is something that that I recognize in Australia. The culture was very ruthless, right? I have to say, you know, compi- <laughs> and again, Australia at that stage, you know, was it, it's very far. It's very isolated. It, you know, it was trying to be part of Asia, but how they handle crises there are, are, is, is, are quite ruthless. I mean, they, they go through cuts and, 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 and try and restructure organizations in, in, a, in a very brutal way. I think it's changed a bit, but um, if I go back um, uh, to my time, it was in the, it was in the 90s, so it, was, it was quite a while ago. Um, certainly in that case, I, I would classify it as, as being rather ruthless. Mm. If I look at Asia, Asia was a little bit different. In Asia, um, you had you had you know uh, economies that were growing very very fast, um, so you could kind of hold on, knowing that the the promise of a good time or or, or a recovery was just around the corner, because the underlying um, or the the underlying uh, economic factors meant that you know, the growth phase was coming. So you did not have to be as brutal, let's say, when, mm. when it comes to uh, managing crises and, 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 uh, and, and things like that. Europe, if I look at Europe, uh, on the other hand, Europe um, is difficult. It's, it's, it's very difficult to manage crises in, in, uh, uh, in Europe, mainly because of historical factors, because of legacy. The way the labor force is structured, the way ca- countries operate, and the, and, and the way the governments, uh, uh, you know, uh, operate and protect and limit what you can do. They're very. It's a protectionist sort of uh, uh, region. If I if I uh, you know want to use the the right word there. Now we come to the Middle East. The Middle East. Um, the beauty of the Middle East is you've got very developed markets and you've got some developing markets and you really got some struggling struggling countries um, and each of these have different aspects uh, to, to them um, if you look at the developed the developed markets that is many of the ones in, that are in the Gulf flexibility of labor is is um, um, is certainly there, and it was actually, if you go back to COVID, it was actually simplified further, so it became easier for companies to 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 resize if they needed to resize or or, uh, or whatever they needed to do. Um, but certainly, again, the fundamentals that were underlying the economy meant that when when COVID subsided, you had a situation where you could quite easily rebound. Mm. Um, some haven't rebounded, but that's not because of, of, of COVID, but because of their own uh, economic factors. I mean, markets like Egypt that are, that, are, that are struggling, Lebanon for obvious reasons. But one of the things that you do see is that even in the struggling markets, you still find that the people are incredibly resilient. So they find ways to overcome they find ways to still try to prosper, be entrepreneurial, and 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 come up with solutions 
that enable them to get through that that period, even though the government doesn't support, the the, the structure isn't there, the 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 the, uh, the fiscal policies that are in place are not supporting, that there's still ways and means for the public, um, you know, uh, to to find you know to to prosper, to find ways to prosper and overcome that. Um, fundamentally finance, the role of finance in all those markets are pretty much the same. Mm. Even though what I've described are very, very different markets, you know, very, very different situations, all right? The fundamentals are still the same. And if you think about it, going back to what I, what I uh, started with, those, those initiatives that I spoke about, cost management, liquidity management, early warning signals. These are the basis of success for any finance person in any of those markets. True. Now, as a finance leader, uh, I love the analogy that you drove across all the regions. I think there is an environment, uh, background, culture, background on how people respond back to the crisis as well. Look at Australia, isolated, tough environment. Yeah. And whenever there's a crisis, they are very ruthless, as you said, yeah. responding back to that. Uh, as well, the Middle East, because of the number of the crises we see, there, so the resilience of the people is much more higher. And uh, the, the way we deal with the crisis is a little bit different to other regions as well. But now as a finance leader, when your company, your organization in a crisis as we speak now, how, you, how do you keep the team motivated? For me, um, as a finance leader, I feel a little bit awkward saying it myself, but I lead from the front. I, I definitely lead from the front. And it's not only about um, walking, you know, uh, the talk. To talk. It's really actually being a leader, being there and leading, you know, being, you know, at the close. Who, who is there? At midnight, trying to close close the books at the end of the quarter, who's providing the right guidance to make the the process as seamless as possible? Who is protecting the team when they need to be protected? Who is helping them um, make decisions that are smart decisions, that are wise decisions, that that you know, in order to to move on to the next uh, to to the next step? I think this is something that I, I hold very close to my heart. And I think, you know, uh, a lot of people that I've worked with over the years have thanked me for that. Because mm. um, I think, you know, uh, this is the least you can do. This is the, really the least you can do as a finance leader. Mm. Um, and again, I go back to the mentors I've had. It's what they did. Mm. It's what they did, you know. Um, I had one, one uh, let's call him a CFO, a uh, long time ago. Um, was looking to contribute any any way he could, but on that project he was not really involved. But came in at the end because we were printing printing uh, um, documents to submit to a client, mm -hmm. and he was just filling paper into the printer, and that's he was happy to have that role, mm -hmm. you know, because just having him there. The presence of, of him being there was was enough for me, and I said, "Wow, you know what I mean." Given his stature, given his his credibility, given his knowledge, given what I've learned from him, the fact that he's there it just really, really took it to another level. Yeah. Okay. Now, uh, speaking about leading uh, from the front, uh, you know, there is a say that when the business is growing, flowering. Uh, achieving uh, sales are uh, uh, in a right shape. There is no more questions about, there is no deep analysis question required because everyone is happy at this moment. But when the business in crisis, everyone starts to question all the process, give the finance team some hard time on that, being the gatekeeper or the one presenting the numbers at the end. Now, and especially in the crisis, people behave differently because the salesperson is massively under pressure. 
he or she is under pressure to deliver certain numbers and you're cutting investment. The competition is taking over. There is a crisis in the company as an overall. What kind of leadership, the finance, not the technical aspect, the leadership, but finance leader and the finance team as well at the same time, play a role at that time to make sure that we guide the business into the right direction from a leadership point of view. Okay. I want to use a couple of different analogies on this one. Mm. Okay. You, you follow football. Yes, of course. Okay. And when you, when there's a football game on, there's a guy that keeps score, correct? Mm. So at half time, when Liverpool is up two one, mm. nobody debates the score. You might debate, oh, he missed the penalty or whatever, or he shouldn't have got whatever, but the score is the score. Exactly. Yeah. And, I often use this, you know, to, to, to explain a position and say, you know, you know what, the business is the business, but at the end of the day, there's only one score, right? So this is the score. And again, finance's role is to kind of keep score, right? Mm -hmm. Keep score in, in, from a totality standpoint and from an accountability standpoint, mm -hmm. because the last thing you want to do is lose a sense of accountability, right? When no one is accountable. Or doesn't believe in the score. Correct. Correct. But the score is, you can only have one view of the score. You can have a view, and I, I always say, you can always have a view of the future. That can be subjective. You might think the business is going to grow 10%, maybe 15 Somebody might say 20 Why not? You know, but at the end of the day, the actual result is the actual result. And this cannot be debated. If you debate the actual result, it, it doesn't make any, you know, you lose all foundation. So having that actual result and owning that result from an accountability perspective is, is really, really important. The other thing I've noticed, and, and you know, uh, when I lived in Asia, there were a couple of occasions when the crisis demanded finance leadership. So I had to actually step in and be the managing director in addition to my role as, as CFO because of the the main purpose for that time was to maneuver the company and get through the crisis, right? And, and that's, that's, uh, that's something that, that we've seen. If you've got really, really strong, um, you know, financial skills, you can certainly be put in, in, in that role uh, and, and asked to take a leadership position for, for, a, for a time until the market recovers when you can have a more conventional uh, managing director in charge of that organization. So I actually had to do that in Malaysia when I, when I lived there, uh, um, well, nearly 20 years ago now. Yeah, <laughs> so it's been, it's been quite a while. So that, that for me is important. The, the, the other thing is account, ensuring accountability is, is really the role. I mean, I, I, I can't, you know, uh, push this point enough. It's really something which, which finance should try to drive during the times of crisis to make sure that if there are certain guidelines that are that have been adopted that they are adopted you know and and keeping everything in in uh, in check from that regard yeah. okay uh, it just brought my attention when you played the managing director role yeah and you got the chance for the first time to see the other side of the coin yeah. as a partner when you look back at finance from outside have you observed something in finance that need to be changed? Not really. Not really. Not really. I just it just drew on me how how important the partnership is between mm. finance and the leadership. So you've seen the the the, the importance of more connect Correct. between. The Correct. finance and, and the, the leadership. And the how, leadership how we, when, when that works and when that works and that works right, magic is done, you know. Mm. Um, and that's it, that's that's reality. I mean, I mean, when when you see uh, um, finance and, and for, you know finance operating at its best, it's really when when you have a real um, you know partnership, you know, with your chairman, uh, with your MD. Yeah, and and uh, you know that that's that's uh, that's certainly yeah, important.
Okay. So w- one last question on that section. Uh, when you have limited resource and you have pressure on the delivery, you rationalize your investment. But at the same time, especially nowadays, you need to strike the balance between short-term goals and much longer-term goals. Longer-term goals in business require investment as well. It's not going to happen uh, for free. How do you strike the balance between short-term investment and long-term investment in business? You have to do both. You cannot only operate on the short term. Mm. Okay, So when you do decide to invest, you need to make certain decisions. Again, have the rigor in place in order to ensure that, okay, what is my payback period? What is my return on investment? These are the the the, the, the metrics that you need to deploy mm. in order to decide how much you want to invest for the future and how much you want to spend today. Unless, of course, the project is strategic. strategic. <laughs> 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 Which then is, is a... But, you know, I, I, again, I, we're laughing, but it's, it's, the reality is... Um, you cannot underestimate the rigor that should go into any sort of investment decision. Mm. And I think when it's done well with scenarios, you've got obviously the, the, the worst case, the mid case, the best case, and hopefully you land at the best case. Mm. You know, um, you know it, it happens. I, I've, I've had business cases where the result has been 10 times better than what you assumed. Mm. You know, and that does happen. That does happen. Um, sometimes it doesn't work out that way, mm. you know? but at least you've gone through and you've, you've, you know, you've considered all all the possible scenarios, right? To ensure that one, you can handle it, you can handle the the, the worst case, but at the same time, live up to the best case if should that uh, should that materialize, mm. you know? Okay. Uh- now, if we just want to close our discussion, especially in the crisis mood, and you've seen all of this, mashallah, all of this crisis across all the region, um, across all the globe, actually, not only the region. Yeah. Uh, you've seen the generation, the finance team uh, joining across different generation and, you know, the Gen Z, as you speak now. If you're just going to keep an advice for the younger version of you, for example, as you speak now, after all of this period, if you're going to give yourself an advice, I'm not going to count the days or the years, X number of years ago, what advice you're going to give to yourself? From a career and personal point of view, I'll leave it for you to decide. Okay, I think let's talk a little bit about the Gen Z, if I may. Okay. Mm. Um, And I think What is missing today from this generation is ultimately resilience. And I'll say, I'll, I'll I'll talk a little bit more about that in, in, in a career, you will go through a lot of challenges, right? And what we do see now with, with the Gen Z is every time there's a small challenge, they kind of give up. They kind of, oh, it's too hard. Oh, it's not for me. Oh, I want to try something else. And, and, and you, you, you're not all the way. You don't sort of push yourself through it. And I think, I'm sure you've had it yourself as well, is that when you do have a challenge, the beauty of it is fighting through right, those challenges and coming out the other side in order to tell the story. I think this is something, you know, um, the Gen Z should try to adopt more, okay? Mm. Going back to myself, hard work. I went to university at night. I, I was a trainee during the day. I studied at night. I, I, my days were 15 or 16 hour days, mm. right? And after four years, I, I graduated and I had four years of experience, right? Mm. So it put me ahead of the pack at that time. You know, I ended up being being the youngest CFO in in in, in the company. That's Australia yeah. impact, I yeah, think. Absolutely, yeah. but you tr- it's because it's the battler bat- battle of spirit. You know, mm. you really want to push yourself. You realize you're so far away from the rest of the world, but if you fight hard enough and you work hard enough, actually, you can make it. Mm. You can make it. But I think that goes for anyone. Mm. And I think if I if I'm a young guy who wants to be 
a finance leader, think about that. Think about, you know, really um, pushing yourself, overcoming challenges, overcoming negativity. Um, you might have missed that promotion, but try again. You might have missed that opportunity to fulfill, uh, you know, your dreams, but try again. You know, I think this is this is something that uh, the younger generation should try to really push for. And I think if they do that, they will become stronger as a generation, as a group, you know, and, and they will appreciate, you know, very much when they do come out the other side of a challenge, you know, they will feel, wow, actually, that was that was that was quite an experience. And they'll tell the tale. They'll be able to tell the story to uh, to others, and I think that's something that uh, that they really need to uh, need to look for. The other thing is, and I and I, I um, uh, as a, as a finance person, I always say this: as a finance person, you live and die by your ethics and principles. So, it's so important that you always act the most ethical, in the most ethical way as possible. It's really, really, because if you lose your integrity in finance, you lose everything. Oh. If you're selling used cars, what does it matter, right? Mm. It's not why, you know, it's not why you're hired, right? You're selling, because you're a good salesman, you're able to sell used cars and these sorts of things. Mm. However, as a finance person, no matter where you are, no matter which market, which country, Right? Your integrity is such an important thing and should never, you know, never be, be uh, um, compromised for any reason. You know? And again, this is why I say both through hard work, strong integrity, the future is yours. Okay. Uh, Ralph, I think that's, that's a very nice closing for the, for the discussion. Hard work and uh, integrity. And I fully agree with you um, because finance, many of the day, they take some hard calls when it comes to accounting part, managing the business, taking some tough discussion, tough decision, uh, give the business options with some tough decision. And we're the one bringing this on the table as you speak. So the minute that you're going to lose the integrity of that, that would be the end of it. As right. like that. No one will be listening. This is where you gain the trust going back to the seats where the finance has a seat on that on that uh, on that table and it took us through for a nice ride from all the crises different geography different uh, uh, industry and how we can navigate that and come out of the wood as you said from crisis to prosperity as a finance leader landscape Rafa, it was really a pleasure having you in the discussion and i always see you as an inspiring leader to be honest uh, uh, the reason that we're having this discussion because we connected in one of the conference and your speech at that conference was really to the point. I'm really uh, pleasured having you on the, on the show. So thank you very much for that. Rida, thank you. Really appreciate it. And let's not wait for the next crisis to talk again. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.